If you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn to Acts chapter 14? We're going to begin in verse 1. Uh, we're continuing our study through Paul's first missionary journey. We're about halfway through this uh, study. You're turning there. You know, the city of Fort Worth, Texas is very dear to my heart. As many of you know, um, I lived there for three and a half years, and there were some wonderful things that happened while I was there. One is I met Karen Jones, and uh, we became married, and that was top on that list there at that time. But also our oldest son, Wilson, was born in Fort Worth, Texas. I thought Texas, everything was hot. I didn't realize he was born December 29th, and we had to make it our way through sleet to get to the hospital the night uh, that he would be born the next day. Um, it was there that I met a lot of dear friends that are still very close to me, that uh, we studied the Word of God together there. Uh, some of the poorest people I ever met in my life were in Fort Worth, Texas, and they were preacher boys studying to go into ministry, living off of potted meat and, and fried bologna. And I always admired to see the sacrifices a lot of people uh, made in order to, to prepare for the ministry. Fort Worth is a great place. If you've never been there, I would encourage you to go. Uh, if you like the stockyards or if you like uh, rodeos, it's a great place to be. It's the best Tex-Mex food you can find anywhere is in Fort Worth, Texas. There's so many wonderful things about Fort Worth, but there's one thing that I nor anyone else liked about Fort Worth, Texas, and it was this, the temperature can change drastically. And uh, we live on this side of the Blue Ridge Mountains. We don't understand that. Uh, but there were times uh, when the temperature would change so drastically and the natives of Fort Worth would say, well, just stay around an hour and it will change because it would. I remember one time, and I shared this a few years back, I went in a grocery store. I came out 30 minutes later. The temperature had dropped 45 degrees. I wasn't ready for that. Uh, but uh, they had what were called blue northers, and they would just sweep through down through uh, the Midwest and come right down. And there were no broad oak trees and no mountains to keep that wind from changing things very quickly. You know, we really don't like fluctuation, do we? I mean, a, a lot of us, myself included, we began to complain when we said, well, why is it so hot one day, the next day it's been cold this week? But it's not just a temperature that bothers us when it fluctuates, but what about when people fluctuate? Uh, you may see someone one time and they'll just gladly wave at you, see the next time and they turn away like they never knew you, and you begin to wonder, what's up with that? But as we look at it today, we see the Lord Jesus Christ faced fluctuating responses to his ministry. We see it everywhere. In fact, it was probably the greatest microcosm or picture of that was the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. We celebrate Palm Sunday when Jesus was coming in to the holy city. People were laying their garments in the palm branches and they were saying, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Five days later, there were crowds that were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Aren't you glad that Jesus' ministry was motivated not by what people thought of him, but by what he knew God had called him to do? Well, today we're going to look at Paul, and we're going to look at Barnabas in this first missionary journey. And we see that they saw this same dichotomy. We saw that in the same ministry, there were people who were embracing it and euphoric about it, Yet there were others who were working against them, who were rejecting it, who were persecuting them. Look with me at Acts chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. It says, In Iconium they entered the Jewish synagogue as usual and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Now why did they, uh, as an aside, why were they in Iconium? Persecution had driven them from uh, uh, Pisidian Antioch, where we saw they were last week. And so here they are in Iconium, but look at verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. 
So they stayed there a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord who testified to the message of his grace by enabling them to do signs and wonders. But the people of this city were divided, some siding with the Jews and others with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Jews and Gentiles uh, with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they, that is Paul and Barnabas, found out about it and fled to the Lyconian towns of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding countryside. There they continued continued preaching the gospel. In Lystra, a man was sitting who was without strength in his feet, had never walked, and had been lame from birth. He listened as Paul spoke. After looking directly at him and seeing that he had faith to be healed, Paul said in a loud voice, stand up on your feet. And he jumped up and began to walk around. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the town, brought bulls and breeze to the gates because he intended with the crowds to offer sacrifice. The apostles Barnabas and Paul tore their robes when they heard this and rushed in the crowd shouting, people, why are you doing these things? We are people also just like you, and we are proclaiming good news to you that you turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and everything in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to go their own way. Although he did not leave himself without a witness, since he did what is good by giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling you with food and your hearts with joy, even though they said these things, they barely stopped the crowds from sacrificing to them. Some Jews, though, came from Antioch and Iconium, and when they had won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. After the disciples gathered around him, he got up and went into the town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, Lord, may we be found faithful. This gospel train that we see that is moving from place to place in the book of Acts is still alive and working today. But as we see today, there'll be varying responses. But Lord, help us as a church, us as, a, us as individuals, to persistently and consistently carry the gospel. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we're studying Paul's first missionary journey, and we can't begin to imagine the roller coaster they're going through. I mean, in the same context, within two verses, we see that there's a crowd that's ready to elevate them to the position of God, uh, Godship, to, to just a couple of verses later, people that are ready to and did stone and persecute them. Paul had had a successful and fruitful ministry in this part of the world. He had been in Pisidian Antioch, and and, and while he was there, he saw a lot of fruit in it. But as I said earlier, he ends up being where we find him today in Iconium because there were people who opposed him. And, and you would think that he would just avoid that. But it seemed and it was very true that wherever Paul went, there was this. Uh, divided response to the gospel. There were those who were excitingly embracing what he was said, uh, saying and those who were uh, rejecting it. This morning I titled the message, The Gospel Train on the move. And the gospel was on the move. Paul left uh, along with Barnabas and others, um, the sending church in Antioch of Syria. We see that they traveled across the Mediterranean. They arrived in this part of the world and wherever they were going, they were carrying the gospel message. The gospel was advancing to different people and different places. And that's God's desire today. He desires that the gospel not just stay in one church, not just stay among one family, but the gospel advance to different people and different places. And we have that mandate today. There are somewhere over 8.1 billion people on the earth at this time. Somewhere around five and one half billion have not heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ or do not have a regular witness to the Lord. There are still 7,400 people groups in the world who are considered unreached with the gospel. That would be like 
maybe 1% of an entire people might have some type of gospel message. In other words, over 42% of the world's population has yet to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have a commission to take that gospel. That's why we have missions in as part of our budget. That's why we support uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering during the Christmas season, where all of that money goes to, to advance the gospel and support the work of missionaries around the world. I would encourage you as we move into this season of Christmas to make a, an important plan as your Christmas gift to the Lord Jesus Christ of giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. It's his birthday, by the way, and he's the one who's given us the commission. Shouldn't we support that work? And so today, I want us to see how the gospel was advancing through Paul. In spite of the adversity, in spite of the successes, uh, and we're going to see ironically that even the successes, we might say, could have been a hindrance. Uh, we're going to look at how that gospel was advancing, and then we're going to look at two things that were really a threat to that, which also can be a threat to us today. But first, I want you to see that the gospel was advancing to different people in different places. Having been opposed in Antioch of Assyria, Paul landed in Iconium. That was almost 100 miles southeast, so he traveled a great distance. And we see in verse 1 that he followed the same pattern. He went into the synagogues. The gospel was for the Jew first, but it was not to stop there. It was to go to the Gentiles. And so they began sharing the gospel. But one verse that really jumps out at me, in spite of all that was happening, in verse 7, it says, there they continued preaching the gospel. They kept preaching the gospel. There were people who were accepting the message. And in the couple of verses before what I just read in, in verses five and six, we see that there were also individuals who were inciting uh, leaders in the community against them. And so the gospel train was continuing to move. No matter what the response of people, Paul and Barnabas had their eye on the Lord and God had called them to this ministry. He had sent them to the church uh, in Syria. Now, Paul was not satisfied with yesterday's results. He didn't say, look, man, we've had a great response here. We've had people. I think we can just take a break for a while. He wasn't set back by the adversity that confronted him. He wasn't focused on yesterday. He had his hand to the plow moving straight ahead. The gospel was going to different people in different places. He didn't suffer from spiritual attention deficit disorder. In other words, with all of the noise around, Around him, of the people that would distract him, Paul kept his focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. He kept the main thing, the main thing. Now, we're not going to get there today. We'll look at it next week. But we're going to see at the end uh, of uh, this week's text, and we just read it, that he was actually stoned and left for dead. They dragged him out of the city, and then he went into various towns, and guess what it said there? There he proclaimed the gospel message. He had been beaten with rocks. He had been threatened. His life was in peril, yet he still continued to preach the gospel. You know, there are many things that the church can and should do. There are so many ministries, but imperative is this, that the church carry the gospel in its community into the world. And it's not the least important thing. It's among the most important things, along with worshiping the Lord. Acts 1.8 says we're to be a witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. One of the uh, goals, and we continue to be talking, is this community where God has placed us. God has strategically placed our church here over 170 years ago, and we're here to be a light in this community. As we go into 2024, we need to be uh, figuring how are we going to minister in this community? What are we doing in this community? All the while continuing to support the work that's going on around the world. Why? Because the gospel train is moving. But I want you to see also with me that while this gospel was moving here in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14, there were two contrasting threats to the advancement. And it's going to sound strange because these two responses were very different, yet each of them 
posed a threat. And one of them is going to almost appear to be unusual that it could be a threat, but we'll, we'll get there in a moment. But I want you to see the first threat was the threat of persecution by people. There are people opposed to the gospel because there is a spiritual force headed up by the devil that is also working against the advancement of the gospel. Well, one of my mentors in ministry, Ben Lehman, I mentioned my buddy Clarence and how he just called it like it was. Ben Lehman also was that way. And, and Ben, when we would go visit, he trained me in personal evangelism, door-to-door -door evangelism in the city. And he used to say this all the time. He said, Rick, when we go in, he said, expect the unexpected. There's going to be something that's going to happen. You're going to get to the point where you're sharing the gospel and a baby's going to cry or something's going to fall off the mantle or somebody's going to get a phone call, you can almost expect it because the devil doesn't want people to hear the gospel. And he was so right. So many times that would happen. Here, while Paul and Barnabas were carrying out the ministry, Satan was working through both Jews and Gentiles. The, the crowds were being stirred up to oppose the message. In fact, verse 2, it says that resistant Jews stirred up the Gentiles and literally poisoned their minds, literally brought uh, things that would affect their minds, that would distort the gospel against the brothers. However, I like what it says in verse 3. They stayed there for a long time and spoke the message. They stayed there as long as God would have them to be. Now, we're going to see just a few verses later that because of the persecution, they left that area. We don't judge that. We don't understand that. We know they spent a long time planting the seeds of the gospel. Then the threats that they would be stoned led them to leave the city. Yet the gospel continued to move. Why is that? Because there's one thing the persecution could not stop, and that was the gospel train, that the gospel was continuing to move along the tracks. Was Paul forced to leave two areas? Yes, he was to this point. Yet the seeds were planted, yet when he picked up and he moved out, he continued to carry the gospel. He didn't say, well, boy, I'm really in trouble here. I need to change my plan of action. He stayed with the commission that God had given him. And, and so even as I said, after this text, we see at the end of this text, he was uh, stoned and left for dead. The people stoned him, but he was, he lifted up. The church came around him and he continued carrying out the ministry. I pray that God will give you the boldness in your workplace, among your neighbors, in your community to continue to carry the work of the gospel. There are people here that may reject and resist. They may work with you. They may be a family member or a neighbor. Don't relent. Continue to, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ because history shows us that even in persecution, the gospel will advance. But there's a second threat that is very unusual, and you have to hear it out. But that's the threat of praise from people. You say, well, Rick, I understand the threat of persecution by people. That would cause someone to, to shut up, to, to close the mouth. But, but equally as dangerous can be the threat of praise from people. We've all seen that in our own lives, haven't we? Someone will say something and really build us up, and boy, we hit, we fall right on our face. Because when we become inflated, a lot of times it's right before something bad is going to happen. Well, this threat here came from the mouths of a congregation that saw an event. There was a man in Lystra. He was without strength. From birth, he had never walked. And this man set his eyes on Paul. Paul set his eyes on him. The situation appeared hopeless, and Paul told the man to stand up, and he stood. Now, Paul did not make the man stand. He just said, do it. God was the one that enabled that man to stand. And there's a difference there, because Paul might be able to speak the word, but only God can transform the body. A preacher can speak the word, 
but only the Holy Spirit can transform the heart. So never be mistaken, no matter how eloquent a preacher may be, no matter how gifted uh, a proclaimer the gospel may be, it is not about the messenger, it's about the message and the one who sent him. And God is the one. When you hear the gospel, it is not the convincing of a preacher that will transform your life. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in it. And so Paul understood that. Barnabas understood it. But the crowd didn't. The crowd saw this exchange. They saw the miracle had happened. And immediately they began to lift up Paul and Barnabas and they worshiped them. They thought they were uh, uh, physical manifestations of the Greek gods, of Zeus and of Hermes. I was reading John Stott and his commentary on that, and it's very interested. And I believe it was Ovid who wrote the Metamorphosis about 50 years before this happened. And it was a fictional story about how uh, the false gods of uh, Greek mythology, how they came down to the earth and people rejected them and, and did not receive them and how later they were judged. So you could imagine if that were the context, the crowd here would have said, boy, we don't want to make that same mistake. And that in that fictional uh, account and so immediately they began to lift up Paul and Barnabas they called Paul Hermes which was the false messenger God and they called Barnabas Zeus that was to be the chief of the gods and probably because Barnabas was older than Paul they even in verse 13 uh, called in a, a false priest to come in and prepare the sacrifices they were going to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. Imagine you don't understand the Lyconian language. You see things that are happening. They're starting to call in the priest and they're gathering all of the stuff to worship and you realize they're worshiping you. So what happened to Paul and Barnabas? They tore their clothes. They were really upset. They rushed into the crowd trying to correct them. And they said, why are you doing these things? They wanted to clarify things. And so the gospel train stopped for a moment. Not forever, but it stopped. Why did it stop? Because Paul and Barnabas needed to clarify the gospel is about Jesus Christ, not about them. And so the gospel is from God and it's about God. Men are men. God is God. Preachers have come and gone. The gospel is still here. God is the one who transforms life. And it's a dangerous thing when a person or persons think that they are inexpendable, that they are essential to the kingdom of God because they're not. And Paul and Barnabas, praise God, understood that. They would not be a distraction for the people. And so they said, we got to stop this thing right here. Let me clarify. And so they took the people where they knew. These weren't Jews who had the law. These were, were pagan people who did not know God, and they began to teach them that God was the one who created them, who, who had given them, who had provided them, who was watching over them. And they began to what? Take the focus off of themselves and point to God. And by the way, that's what we're supposed to do. When we're in the workplace, hey, we want to be considered righteous people, but it's not about us. We want to always be pointing people to Jesus Christ. And there are really two thoughts here I want to look at. We need to avoid the praise of people. Don't ever take God's glory. There was a man just two chapters earlier, Herod, in Acts chapter 12, People listened to him speak, and they said he has the voice of a God. And the scripture said he did nothing like Paul and Barnabas did to try to stop things. In fact, he enjoyed the adulation. He didn't stop the praise and redirect it toward God. And the scripture says the angel struck him dead and worms ate his body. You see, there's not enough room for a person who's carrying a message and for the one who sent him to have the glory, the one to receive the glory is God. 
We need to carry the gospel secondly in Jesus' name. It's not just that we do ministry, but we do ministry in the power of the Lord pointing people to Jesus Christ. That famous verse in Matthew 10, 42, whoever gives a cup of cold water in my name will never lose his reward. What does that say? That we don't just serve. The Peace Corps can do that. We serve to bring glory to God. If we just meet a physical need in serving, then we've missed the greatest need, which is the eternal spiritual need that only God can can feel. So the, the physical need, the cup of cold water is there. But if we do that, but don't point people to Jesus, we're missing the message. So Paul and Barnabas stopped here. They clarified. When the people were trying to praise them, they said it was all about Jesus. And then two short verses later, we read in that same area, Paul was hit with stones and left for dead. But God wasn't finished with him. And God is not finished with you and me today. The gospel is still as alive and still as powerful as it has ever been. And as we said earlier, Paul, when he got up, I'm sure they, he was probably stunned. He got up. He had his strength. He went to the next town and he kept on preaching. Praise, persecution, they were threats. They didn't stop him. I wonder today, what ministry has God given you? God has given you a ministry in this church. God has given you a ministry in this community. Are you carrying out what God has put on your heart to do? And are you doing it for the glory of God? Are you deflect, deflecting personal praise? I'm not saying don't try to be a good person, don't try to do good things, but are you conscious, are you yourself not letting your right hand know what your left hand is doing? Are you deflecting the praise even from yourself and giving the praise to God? Are you willing to continue even if it means discomfort, even if it means hardship? And do you have a heart for this community? One thing about Paul, wherever he went, he had a heart for the people there. He wanted to interact with the people. He took the time we saw in uh, Antioch of Pisidia. Even after Saturday was over, even after the time that they were in the synagogue worshiping, even in the afternoon, he continued with the work. I wonder, do you have that type of perseverance? Do you have a heart for your neighbors, for the people in the workplace? Do you have a heart for this community? And are we carrying Jesus with us wherever we go? Let's pray. Father, as we have looked at Paul and Barnabas and their team, what an example to us of perseverance. In the midst of wrong intended praise and wrong acting persecution, they continued to avoid the distraction and do what you had called them to do, what the church at Antioch of Syria had sent them to do. Father, you've given us, the church today, a similar ministry, thus us as a church, a corporate body, and as individuals, to preach the gospel where we go, to support those who go where we're not able to go. So, Lord, as we enter this season of Christmas, when we celebrate the greatest missionary who ever lived, and Lord, it wasn't Lottie Moon, it was Jesus Christ, because he left his home in heaven to go into this earth and to live a perfect life and to preach and to die for us. As we do that, Lord, help us to have giving hearts as we have the opportunity to support missions all the while doing what you've placed in front of us. Lord, when you closed a door in one area and Paul went to the next area, he knew what he was supposed to do to minister. Lord, help us to do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.